Okay, folks, uh, welcome to Quantum Leap uh, with David and Corey. And I just got the clearance. I'll let you double check that, that we are live. And um, we have a special show for you today in that we're going to cover some more concepts out of the, uh, the Rising Star program. Let me just get this up here. Okay. Um, we're going we're gonna to go over uh, terror barrier, which is really fear of change and attitude and leadership. So um, these are some key topics. And uh, but first, I wanted to have my co-host, uh, Corey, not introduce himself. And if you want to do a, a check in, Corey, I know you have a marketing thing coming up. Just tell us what we should know about or all entrepreneurs might want to know about with Lyft that are coming up. Oh, yeah. So uh, Corey not here and I am a business coach with Take Wing Coaching. And yeah, so the thing that we're doing right now, especially Gail's been working very hard on is a new marketing program. And we're hosting a webinar tomorrow night uh, from five to six, five to six thirty. And it's going to be on the topic of basically marketing for small business, how to create content, what creates content to create, how to find an ideal target market, like, you know, where are my customers? So where should I be advertising or, you know, sorry, social media marketing. And I'll be covering some areas of mindset because one of the things that people often get stuck in is like, are people going to like my content? Is this good content? What should I be doing? And um, how do I remain consistent? Uh, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today with your terror barrier kind of stuff is some of the things that comes up, even in social media posting that people are, trying to put themselves out there and, and they don't know what people are going to think about it. So uh, we're going to be talking about that and covering a number of other things. And uh, the goal is, is eventually some people will be interested in signing up for a multi-week program to work with Gail and I on improving their marketing. Yeah, no, great. I'll look forward to it. Either way, I will we'll put the link. Great tips. Yeah. I'll put yeah. The link. You can get to it on your website, but I'll try to put the link to that, um, how to sign up for it um, in the uh, comments. And, you know, I, I do think marketing is such a great example of this terror barrier concept. I actually have something I want to read out of this workbook from the Bob Proctor program, Thinking Into Results. You know, look at my business coach, Padna Leitner. I'd suggest going through this whole program if you haven't, because I, I really think this concept of terror barrier you could do everything else right, but if you don't crack this, you know, this fear of change or the terror barrier, as I, you know, Bob Proctor calls it that, um, then you're going to stay right where you are. And, you know, that's unfortunate. I, I do think this doesn't mean that you don't have discretion. I heard Earl Nightingale use this great phrase about telling of stories and that, um, you know, if you have any doubt, when you're giving a public speech about telling a story, maybe it's slightly offensive or include some, you know, don't tell it. So, you know, you still want to use discretion in how you post, but this is more about, you know, programs and things. So um, here we go. I'm just going to read some of what uh, Bob, this is actually Bob Proctor and Sandy Gallagher. Fear and growth go hand in hand. When you courageously face the thing you fear, you automatically experience the growth you have been seeking. And, you know, we all run from things at certain times, but if you actually face your fears, then that's what enables the growth. Go back in history, study the biographies and autobiographies of every individual who has accomplished anything of any consequence. And you will find that although they may have disagreed on many points of life, without exception, they were all in complete and in unanimous agreement on one point, that we become what we think about. That is the point that we sh should provoke you to ask some serious questions, such as what is thought? How do you how does a thought have such a powerful impact on us? You see, it is the ideas in our mind that cause our behavior to be as it is. Ideas are nothing but thoughts or a collection of thoughts brought together. Thought is energy. It is the most potent form of energy. And I'll just read one more quick summary here. For a person to change their results, they must change their paradigm. This is really your ways of thinking. And this requires strong conscious control over our thinking. So, um, you know, and even when you do change your thinking, you're still going to come up with this terror barrier, which 
they have this great image. I'll just put it up on the screen here. And, um, you know, Bob Proctor's big on visualizations. Um, the, so essentially, if you're stuck and you're just kind of not, you don't feel like you're growing, you're not happy where you are, you're in bondage, he says. But then sometimes we get this outside idea, this why idea, he says, and that comes in and that kind of really stirs up the pot that, hey, we want more. We start thinking about it. And then when we really start to internalize that, that's when this the alarm bells go off and we run smack into this, what he calls a terror barrier, which is where most people never get through on in, in certain things. And, um, you know, what? I actually don't think I would have made it through this without a business coach because, you know, we're so ingrained in our thinking and, you know, a lot of negative patterns of thinking. So I really think you need to reach out to a business coach to break through. But maybe if you're aware of it, um, it's different for everybody, depending on what you're going to do. So I'll, I'll just kind of leave it there. I want to get um, Corey's reaction first to this this little diagram and the concept and what this kind of means to you. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't know a whole lot about, uh, you know, Bob Proctor's um, stuff. I guess I should probably read up more on it, but it, it does make sense. You know, we get these ideas and thoughts and then it's, it's like, how do I actually accomplish this? And, you know, so much stuff doesn't actually get done because of these, of that terror barrier really, as you put it. Um, right. So, you know, growth is getting out of your comfort zone and into that sort of, stretch and that can be scary and the more we attempt to stretch and the further out we push it the you know the, the more the mind is working in the back of the ground saying hey you're going to die out here and it can really feel like you are going to die um because that's what the job of the mind is is to keep you safe from you know being killed by whatever is out there that's dangerous right which could be just being abandoned from the tribe um i mean that's we, we still live a an ancient mindset, even though we live in modern times, there's that, that brain back there, that, that mind is saying, hey, you've got to, you know, you've got to fit in. People have to, you know, you have to be fed and, and live. And if you do these things, it could lead to, you know, dangerous results. And that's where the terror comes in. It's, it's, it's normal, it's natural, and, um, but we can break past it because it's not really true. Yeah, no, well put. And I know before I put out each of my programs, I felt like I got stalled for a while, including Rising Star was the first one. And then, um, you know, industry leader, and then we're going to have thought leader. So, you know, we, we kind of make up excuses about why we shouldn't do things. Or you mentioned the great thing, you know, me doing video, everybody hits a terror barrier with video and same with marketing. But these are the, the big pieces to really break through out there in business you have to find a way to get through them. I don't know if you have any other examples of maybe terror barriers you've faced in your life and some of the things I know you part of your why and some of the things you've done around coaching could classify as a terror barrier, maybe even launching lift, but. Um, yeah. Um, you know, launching lift is actually not so bad. I know Gail has things that she gets stuck on there, but um, I, I think it's more of, you know, well, public speaking is definitely a common one, and I've had my own, but I did some work to get past that. Um, it wasn't quite intentional, but it worked out well for me. Uh, you know, putting myself out there in terms of some of the kind of coaching I really want to do, that's still been really hard for me. I'm working with a reputation consultant to build my expertise, and I'm falling back into, you know, the, the partnership work, which I think is a great step above what I'm already doing. But there's more I want to accomplish, and I still have that, you know, <laughs> fear of putting myself out there for, to do it. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, it's it's just the the constant constant growth. Um, what other things? You know, referral marketing. When I started coaching, it was on referral marketing. Most, you know, David and I are BNI. We know a lot of bni folks and what i learned is that people really actually fear reaching out to build a relationship there's a lot of of uncertainty in that when you meet somebody you just get along with i mean david is very good at getting along with people and we get along great so it's kind of an easy fit but when it's not such an easy fit people uh fear trying to make it a good fit and yet the the biggest gold and referral marketing and probably that's the best kind of marketing you can do is is 
working on those alliances is going to be with people that you don't really get along with very well at first, right? But they may be successful, they may be more successful, they may have, um, you know, something that you want, but there's a fear of rejection, and there's, there's a fear that it's not going to work, and so we just don't even make it happen. Or we do a little bit, but we don't keep it up consistently. And that was actually one of the biggest things I ran into at referral marketing was most people really get stuck on that. Yeah. You know, I, I think so, the probably I have this next question about advice for people and how to overcome their terror barrier or fear of change. And I think you're the probably the one who's helped me the most on this just by talking things through um, to have like a friend where there's no judgment and to be able to just talk things through. And um, because before you kind of release something to the world, you almost have to have a little bit of a test case about what it is. And it, it always, and it inevitably gets better. You know, in my old career, I would produce everything almost by myself. And then you just put it out to the world. But ideally, it's good to have some friends who can, you can um, kind of experiment, you know, kind of pre-release it, so to speak. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, that helps a lot to have that that support there, which is one of the reasons why I'm doing that partnership coaching work, because I think that that's something people can have a lot of value is having somebody else to run the business with. Um, yeah, so you were you were going to talk a little bit about how to overcome the terror barrier, right? Yeah, I was curious if you had any other thoughts about any other advice for um, how to get through this fear of change, you know? And I know you mentioned a number of things, but if you have anything to add, otherwise we can move on to attitude. Um, you know, the fear of change is, um, well, it's always uncertainty, right? And and everyone, you know, some people love change. Some Most people that I've worked with like some change, right? So too much change can be a little bit... Uh, scary, uh, you know, just jumping in, you know, feet first and not knowing what's going to happen. Um, some people like to just kind of keep things going the same, but if, if we're talking about business owners, generally they like a little bit of change, right? So it's a little bit at a time, it uh, incremental. If you're talking about some serious entrepreneurs, sometimes they like it, big risk, but that might just be in the context of what they're doing versus some other context. So yeah, I, I don't have a lot of answers for how to overcome a fear of change other than look at for what motivates you to um, to kind of get out of, you know, a funk, right? Like, what is that fear? And and get into more of a fire, right? Like get into action. What is it? What are the steps of the change? Sometimes just breaking it down because it can be, I, I find that things like change look like a big blob, right? It's It's a sort of shiny object, but it might be a little bit scary to go beyond it. So start breaking it down into its elements. What does each step of that change look like? Because if you're a step-by-step -step change person and you've got a big change coming, break it down into those little steps and just realize it's going to happen maybe a little faster than you normally want it to be. Yeah, I do feel like change is a bit contagious that sometimes if we're stuck in one area of our life, there's other blockages that are kind of related to that that can kind of fall down when you start making the change. So maybe you want to, you know, maybe you don't work out and you also want to make a business change. So to really, you know, start working out and do the business change, because all those things kind of goes together. And that kind of brings us really to our next thing, attitude that you can be really living life completely in the shadows when you could be leaving, um, living in the light, so to speak, just to borrow analogy. I think that's out of Matthew, but um Nature, I'll just read a passage here on attitude, and we're going to talk about this. Um, I think more than anything, if you can generate a positive attitude, that's what will keep you going. And here's a great passage from um, Bob Proctor, the ABCs of success. Um, Nature gave a wonderful gift to most of her little creatures, a gift we call protective coloring, so that the deer blends into the forest, the fish into the stream, and the bird into the tree. But from one notable creature was this gift withheld. The human creature stands like a sore thumb on any sort of terrain. I believe this is because the human was given a much greater gift. You and I have the godlike power to make our surroundings change to fit us. 
when you change or improve as a person, your environment and surroundings change to reflect this improvement. Just as you can tell what a business is doing for a community by observing what the community is doing for the business. So you can, with a few notable exceptions, tell a person, tell what a person is doing for the community by assessing what the community has done for the person. You can tell a lot about a person by carefully examining his or her environment. Contrary to popular belief, people are not the reflection of their environment nearly as much as we might think. Environment is a reflection of the people. Change the people for the better and the environment will change for the better as well. Watch one person change and that person will leave his or her old environment and seek out a new one, one that more closely reflects their emerging being. Our attitude is the environment we carry with us during the day. It proclaims to the world what we think of ourselves and indicates the sort of person we have made up our minds to be. It is the person we will become, yet as we look at the fish, the bird, or the animals in the wild, we do marvel at how well nature has camouflaged them. But don't you think we should spend a little time being overwhelmed by our great gift of creative ability and do all we can to develop and utilize this ability? Our environment, the world in which we live and work, is a mirror of our attitudes and expectations. Your living is determined not so much by what life brings to you as by the attitude you bring to life. Not so much by what happens to you as by the way your mind looks at what happens. So uh, excuse the kind of long passage, but I, I, I really like that. And that this is another one of Bob Proctor's strong suits about attitude. You know, he kind of says, well, none of these ideas are mine, but some of these ideas he's said better than anybody. And I think attitude are, are some of those. And, you know, same with terror barrier. And it, it's simple. It's not like a whole book, but it's some passages that really um, summarize everything. So, um, you know, if we, if we see failure in everything, then we're going to fail. But if we see success and opportunity, then we can be successful. So let, let me know if you have any thoughts on that passage or otherwise I did want to just ask you, you know, why, why is attitude so important? Well, I mean, attitude is what gets you going forward. It's what, you know, causes people to want to be around you. I mean, as a business owner, it's like, it's, it's absolutely necessary to almost everything you do. Um, and, you know, the better your attitude towards growth, towards change, towards clients, towards other people, the more, you know, you'll have abundance in life. And, and just kind of going with what Bob Proctor said, I think you can also kind of sum it up and is, you know, if you want to change the world, then change your mind. Right. That's that's really what it's about. And and if your attitude is holding you back and, and we all have attitudes that, you know, they come from places, you know, early in our life that we we learn things that it's the right attitude to have in this particular context. And if we still hold on to that as an adult and it's not serving us and it's important to go back and figure out where that's coming from, um, because it's it's if it's not serving you, then then changing it can be difficult. Right. It's, it's good to find the source, understanding, awareness of when it comes up, and then how do you create the redirection towards better attitudes, right? So, if, if you know, I mean, a good example of that is maybe attitude towards wealth. You know, that person has wealth, so there must be something wrong with them. And that's that's something I run into rather frequently. And that often comes from, you know, early in life, we learn that from our parents and that pattern and that attitude. And, and yeah, what it does is it holds us back from creating our own prosperity. Because we we have this attitude that you know people have prosperity. There's something they must have done to get it that wasn't good, and you know that's true sometimes, but it's not always true. So if your attitude is is not helping you gain prosperity, then figure out where it's coming from and how to change it. Yeah, well put. Um, I did. Um, you know, I, I think a big just thinking my own story, really being around people in B and I was a big change for me too, because you do see that attitudes kind of contagious. So if you're maybe in a friend group that is kind of down and really negative on certain things, you know, you might need to just shift like that group that you hang out with. And I think, you know, being around other people who are successful, there's no other bit, no, no better way than to, you know, <laughs> that that just rubs off on you inevitably um 
I, I have this question here that we've talked about on the show, but you know, can you coach or how can you coach people to have a positive attitude or improve their attitude? Have you had any success with that? Yeah, I, I think, um, I, you know, it's, it's not so much about, a, I mean, it can be a positive attitude. It's, it's it, a lot of times people just need to be heard. Right. And a lot of times as coaches, our job is really just to listen and, because people are are not so much stuck in a bad attitude, they're kind of just stuck in a, you know, in, in NLP we call it the water, right? Because you're just kind of like, and and it's you just feel stuck and and unresourceful. So we we help people just draw upon their internal resources, and as they gain some success or you know kind of get into that fire or more comfortable being, you know, moving along and attached and and part of things, then the attitude starts to change. Right. It's like you said, you, you know, when you go to BNI and then you go another week and you keep going week after week, the attitude changes. You, you can't help yourself. Sometimes there are some attitudes within BNI groups that we seek to change as well. Like, you know, we can't grow. We can't find people to come join us. Well, that's an attitude as well. And, and what changes there. And but at the same time, um, helping people have a more positive attitude is really. Just hearing them, hearing their concerns and then reframing it right what are we really stuck on here and and how do we get motivated to to move forward one way or another because that motive once that motivation is there the attitude changes yeah no that's a great point that not necessarily all b and i chapters are, are kind of the same and same with organizations you know i like that tribal leadership model about you know stage one is life sucks stage two is my life sucks And then stage three is like, we are great. So if you're kind of stuck in those lower levels, a negative, how how do you, you know, bring first, you know, it starts with the individual, but then how do you bring the organization up to have a better attitude too, which is another fascinating topic, I think. Yeah. Leadership with vision. Yeah. That's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, getting some new people in the chapter, I've seen um, a lot of times you see, chapters go through transitions you see it in organizations you know businesses um sometimes it can be like one toxic person you know and i i hate to single people out but um you you do see that where if you have somebody who's very kind of domineering and doesn't um doesn't create environment for other people to thrive you know that can be also a very a negative thing which, yeah yeah um Great. Well, let's move on to the last topic here. I have a little passage on leadership I, um, that I'll read here. And um, a leader is a person, this is out of my Bob Proctor thing again. Um, a leader is a person who is the people following them because they want to. If there is one secret in leading people, it is to generate an atmosphere in which others feel at ease and appreciated. Leaders get work done through people. Teamwork is essential up and down the line. Human relations are likely to be strained when people have to be asked to do things that they have not planned themselves or which they might not be keen on doing. Every person in a leadership role, the manager or supervisor, the parent or guardian, salespeople of all types has to do many things which go against the grain when handling workers, customers, prospects, or children. There is less strain on human relations when such unavoidable duties are done in a favorable human atmosphere. The effective leader must be a strong originator. Such a leader must be able to construct a constructive idea and to concentrate on that idea to reject any other idea that is presented, which would not aid in the manifestation of the original idea. So I'll I'll leave it there. There's a lot more to say about leaders, but I really think you know, th- this is a, a topic we're going to continue to discuss more and more on this show. And um, we, we have introduced it before, but um, this, this kind of some big picture questions. And um, I just wanted to, you know, I'll give my thoughts as well. But what benefits do you see that leaders provide um, out there in the business world and our in our economy and nation? Um, do, do you see them as a key part of, of our environment here? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's who brings us forward. Right. And, you know, I, I think especially um, 
you know, there's a lot of different kinds of leaders, right? There's community, there's business, there's political. And, um, but I think we as, you know, leaders in our business community have the most impact, right? Because we're, we're what helps other people, you know, create wealth and prosperity and, and you know, grow so that we have the resources to aid the community and, and help people outside of it. Yeah, I, I just looked around. That that was one thing that I really loved about B&I in the beginning is I really saw all these great leaders, you know, local and community leaders that um, you're not only wearing one hat as a leader, you can be a community leader, a business leader. I know we use Dale Marie as kind of a, a leadership model who is really a leader in a number of different categories. So, right. um, and uh, I just see you know, the kind of the contagion effect that those folks have on other people, because they kind of groom or raise new leaders, you know, teach other people how to become leaders, you know, you see it in chapters that we work in, where you have younger members who kind of work under those folks, and then those people learn from them and start doing the same things, and they become leaders. So, um, you know, I, I, I've said this on the show before and that's kind of why i created the industry leader program that you know i believe that you know our business world really we can always use more leaders and i think particularly right now that we are um fairly short on effective leaders um in the business world and um i was just going to get your thoughts on that if you um see a great need right now or any issues you, you see out there with regard to leaders in the business world um, you know, I think there always could be more. There are a lot of good ones. It's just, uh, there's so much noise. You know, I, I've had the advantage of being around some really, you know, remarkable people. And, and you know, we, we've had Ivan and Mike on here. And, and part of that is, uh, you know, my association with them over the years and, and the number of leaders they brought in, you know, all over the world to, um, from the Ascentive organization. And, and, and so I guess, you know, I do have some advantage of seeing a lot of that, but there is a lot of noise. There's a lot of, a lot of bad business out there too. And, and people who are, um, you know, in it for their own selfish reasons. And we see a lot of that in politics too. Um, so yeah, I think we could always use more. And I know there's a lot of people doing good stuff out there. Rotary does good stuff. My brother is out there working with um, DECA, which is, you know, raising young entrepreneurs to be you know, leaders as well. And, and I think that that's where it really should start is, you know, getting young people to see that, um, you know, they can create the future rather than just, you know, follow a, a path that's set for them. And, uh, and then to do that, you've got to be a creative leader. So. Yeah, well put, I, I do think there are some very strong networks of great leaders out there, and they may not be the the dominant ones with all that noise, as you say, because we're kind of, you know, like in Rotary or, you know, that Richard Branson, Ivan and Mike, who I, I think are kind of model leaders for me. And not everybody, maybe if you're a young person in college, you're not aware of those leaders, you just hear all the noise. So I think it's important for people to seek out those leaders. I, I find a lot of them in books, you know, think of the amazing leadership in business books like Jack Canfield and, you know, Bob Proctor recently passed away. So, um, you know, John Maxwell. So there are amazing people and they kind of have their own networks, but um, I don't see them with all the noise. I, I do think there's a big issue with media and not amplifying like the right voices, so to speak, yeah. this intentionally creating noise um, when there shouldn't be no, you know, it's just, uh, it's a bit of a chaotic time right now. So we'll leave that question there. I do have some thoughts on this next one, but I wanted to get your thoughts first about how, if you have any thoughts on how government or businesses can create a culture and environment where leaders thrive and, you know, I, I love the example of B&I. I mentioned that earlier before we came on is a great model system for how to raise, how to how to create a positive environment for leaders. But if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I, I think, you know, B&I is a great example. Um, and any network, you know, that's one of the things that we taught at, you know, our coach at Ascentive is any network you join, become a leader within it, right? Practice leadership, become, you know, even as just as somebody who just shows up, you know, early and, and greets people at the door, that's, 
kind of helping lead the organization and and being a part of their their meetings and so on and and uh, you know joining boards and helping advise others. There's so many things that we can do. Um, be a part of Rotary or any one of these these um, these groups where you know there's there's growth within the community. I'm not really big on political leadership. I, I find you know my experience with politics has not been really all that positive. Um, and, and I've had some, um, because I think a lot of people there are seeking more, you know, power and, and control, but there are some good people in politics. And, and if you can find those people and, you know, and work within that leadership, that's a good thing too. Um, but I think, I think business is where it's at, which is why I'm in small businesses because there's so much we can do, but we also get busy and it, it can be tough. So I think it's, uh, I, I think we can all help each other be more supportive, right? And and so, you know, understanding that sometimes people, you know, they step forward and they leave for a while, but sometimes they got to step back and deal with their own, you know, life issues. I could, I watched my brother, you know, for the last couple of years deal with different trusts, and then I kind of dealt with mine, and sometimes we just have to kind of hold back. So, you know, recruit other people, train them to be leaders and to step in, and and the more we have, then the better off everyone is. Yeah, no. Well put. And I agree with you. That's a big reason why I got out of politics is the issues I have that, you know, creating a very negative environment for leaders, or it's only a certain kind of leader can thrive there that is based on um, power and control. And, um, you know, I, I really, I was thinking about the big picture thing on, on leadership. I really think James Madison nailed it, that we really have to protect minorities in this nation you know our our constitution was really founded on protecting minorities from the majority so you don't have people just getting crushed if you have minority views so right. the mi majority doesn't need to be protected because they're in the ma majority but um you know thinking about alex de tonkerville's piece about really it's about the mores and values of the country and the you know, since the founding in the 1800s, you have a consensus that we need to protect minorities. But then, you know, gradually, I feel like the consensus broke down in large part. Now we have polarization to where, um, you know, it's not necessarily a consensus that we should protect. Well, it's a little bit different because you have like select classes that don't believe in protecting minorities. Um, minority opinions, so to speak. So it's a very, very tough environment out there for this. I, I do think where I see change is beneficial. Why I love being in the private sector, places like BNI's. I just want to be in environments where you know leadership is valued and young leaders are protected. And that's what I love about not working in politics. What, what I love about the business environment here in the East Bay. I feel like it's very. Um, protective in large part of raising leaders, community leaders, and, you know, m kind of makes me hopeful about the future instead of negative if, if you're in kind of the wrong environment out there. Yeah. You know, speaking of which, I, I think it kind of goes back to the attitude shift too, which is, um, you know, first, that is an attitude, right? One way or another, your attitude about how other people should be is an attitude. And, and if it's not serving you or it's not getting you what you want, where do you need to change it? And, and that's, that's another one is, is, you know, there's a minority of opinions, but there's also um, inclusivity. And, and some people get to get this attitude like, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. But, you know, there, there's stuff kind of programmed into us from an early age. And again, where does it come from? And how can we just listen better and, and be more uh, mindful of, of, you know, what other people's experiences are? And, and it could be, you know, minority, with, but, you know, living in the Bay Area, we also have a lot of immigrants. Um, and uh, we just heard from one of our friends, you know, this week, I, we had met her, you know, about 20 years ago, and, and she didn't speak much English at all, and yet we made her feel very welcome within BNI, and, and she feels like she was able to launch her business because of that welcoming thing, so how do we, you know, change our attitudes to just say, look, you know, we're going to be inclusive, and we're going to be careful that, you know, sometimes people have a different way of perceiving things, and, and that's okay, so how do we work with them in that, and rather than have the attitude that people should be like me. Um, yeah, just to drill down a little bit, since we have a bit more time and we can wrap up soon, I, I was thinking about the things, you know, how I, Ivan Meisner is the visionary besides B&I and what he created there about protecting, kind of creating this like safe environment for business owners. So we have 
all these kind of like basically democratic institutions like we have the membership committee that will work to solve issues if we if you have a complaint so to speak you have to have issue resolution so there's this whole kind of governance of bni that creates this environment it doesn't just happen on its own but you also have to have everybody that buys into that system you don't always have everybody buying into the system but at least a number of people so i don't know if there's other pieces of bni that really kind of show how to create that culture or the environment yeah yeah yeah. um yeah there's many different ways and i think as it goes international there's there's lots of opportunities to um see how other people are doing things and, and learn from them um, but yeah, companies or I, that's what I'm always on the lookout for. Why I love that book, Tribal Leadership, to see the model companies or structures and cultures, what they do. And then, you know, those are those are the minority, but they could be the majority if you had a, a movement to get there. Um, right. So, you know, that's why I see we always see b as a model organization, um, you know, that they, they use the um example of amgen in that book and this changes over time it's a little bit like restaurants i was talking to a friend about old town san diego and how like the 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 same restaurants that are good now are not the same ones that were good when i was there back in the heyday so so things change over time in in management and how to do things you know so well, and I think, you know, even even if you take a look at a BNI, you know, there's, there's there's definitely problems. I mean, I've been with the organization 20 years. I've been a director. I'm kind of, you know, I know a lot of the leaders, not super well, but a little bit within it. J David's a director. Oh, it looks like we're cutting out there a little bit. Folks, just stand by. We're going to hopefully get Corey back. Otherwise, it might be an issue on my end. holding to core values and and still you know having the chapter be you know the focus of things okay great well we're going to leave it there um i'm going to put the link to that marketing course now you do have to be a member to, of lyft to join the marketing no. Is that correct? no no okay it's um open and if you put that guest link in there then it's um it's normally 15 dollars, but it's free for the you know referrals and guests so um it's going to be really valuable. I looked over Gail's notes and it's like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of content here. So um, it, it'll, it'll be a really good free webinar and uh, you get a lot of good stuff out of it. Okay, great. We'll deliver value. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, folks, uh, David and Corey, we're going to sign off this edition of uh, Quantum Leap. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you next week. All right, we'll see you next week. Bye.